Hello, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. We're back. And there, I think we just fixed the glare from the mirror there. Either that, it's either the mirror or the glory, right? Uh, mirror. So I hope you guys are having a wonderful Shabbat so far. And it's good to be back, even though we had an awesome time at Women of Valor last weekend. I wish you all could have been there, whether you're Women of Valor or Men of Valor or Women of Valor. <laughs> Thank you, Nisi. Uh, but it was a wonderful time. And, you know, maybe next year without uh, restrictions or whatever, as many people can come as would like to. Um, but I had a wonderful time. Uh, kind of trying out this new teaching on the Song of Songs to the ladies there. And I didn't get very far. It's so deep. We just, we pretty much just covered a few verses um, in the conference, but I'm looking forward to, to setting up a time. Um, maybe we'll do that in the live stream on Shabbat. Uh, maybe I'll start incorporating it as the second day of our weekly tour teaching. Um, haven't quite hammered that one out yet. Logistics, logistics. Um, but it's it's a I call it a smoking teaching because it's it's just so wonderful. You'll fall in love all over again with the Torah, uh, especially when you get into the king's daughter and who the king's daughter is and who is the bride and all that. It's it's just interesting. So while I work on the logistics of, of bringing in the Song of Songs because I would like to get it taught or at least begin teaching it. I know it, it sounds crazy to start talking about Passover right before the spring feasts, but here's why it's not crazy. We know the feasts are chiastic to one another. And so the spring feasts are reflected in the fall feasts and vice versa. And I would like to teach as much of the Song of Songs as I could um, this fall and this winter, so that when Passover does come around again in the spring, that you'll have a wonderful foundation for decoding some of the, the beautiful resurrection language that is in the Song of Songs. And, and like I, I showed the ladies at the, at the retreat, if we know the Song of Songs is traditionally read during the Passover season, because it's a parable of resurrection, then it makes sense that we would also want to take a, a look at it in the fall season, which is going to kick off with the first of Tishrei or the first of the seventh month. We also know that as the Feast of Trumpets, that's also a resurrection day. So whether we're talking about the Passover or whether we're talking about the Feast of Trumpets, either way, we're talking about resurrection. And so I, I just... Uh, at this point, I feel like we need to start laying that foundation so that you can see the beauty of the resurrection. At the same time, we I think we have to agree, even though I can't hear you agree with me I, in my, my you know, mind's eye or mind's ear. I can hear you agreeing. The world is getting uglier and uglier and uglier. I mean, by the second, not by the minute, not by the hour, by the second. If we look around, the world's getting uglier. But at the very same time the bride of Messiah is becoming more and more beautiful. And I think when you look into the Song of Songs, it's such an encouragement uh, to beautify yourself with the beautification tools that the Father has given us in his word. And so um, we'll, we'll get on into the Torah portion. I don't want to talk too much about something I'm not going to teach on uh, exactly this moment. But that's, you know, that's what lies ahead. And that's where my excitement really is right now in the Song of Songs and just revealing to you the beauty of what you were brought in to the Torah to be and to do and to expect. And I think just because it is so beautiful, the imagery of it is so beautiful and it's so rich with the imagery of the Garden of Eden and it helps you identify like I tell people, you need to live your life with one foot in the garden. And then when it's time to cross over, it's just one more step. Um, it, I think it's much more difficult who are really grounded in the here and the now and the natural world, the physical world, without really thinking beyond what happens when they die. I think the transition 
between this life and the garden is is much more difficult if they merit to go who knows you know it, maybe they won't go at all maybe they'll go to a different destination uh, in which case i think the transition would probably be even harder so uh, at any rate um there's the beauty of that. So just we'll put that on our agenda coming up. And let's get into Kitetse because there's a beautiful, again, picture of the bride in Kitetse. And it means when you go out. And I entitled it the seedy side of war. And I think you'll see why. Because you know me, I have to go back and I have to use the rules of biblical interpretation. And when you do that, it, it's... It feels serendipitous because maybe it's the first time you've ever noticed the correlation, but at the same time, it's reassuring because you know it was there all the time, regardless of whether you saw it for the past 50 years or not, it was there because it's been there since before the creation of the world. It's been in the Torah. These, these connections are there. So in years past, we studied the Torah portion, Kitetse, um, in its causality. And I don't want to do that this week, but I do at least want to mention the principle because as you read, I call it a reader's digest of laws. Um, if you look comparatively, comparatively at the number of laws that are found in each Torah portion, if you look at Kitetse, I mean, it's a huge list, whereas others may not even really have any. There's just, it's narrative, it's story. Um, it might be procedural, but in Kitetse is a long list of laws. And at first they seem to be disconnected. But as we've seen in years past, the implication is there's an element of causality that if you do this, then it could lead to this. If you do this, then it could lead to this. Then it could lead to this. Then it could lead to this. And so starting out with the law of the Yafat To'ar, and I'm going to type that in there. Sometimes I get tongue tied. Yafat to'ar. You hear yafa, which means beautiful. And yafat is like a state of being, a state of being beautiful. And to'ar is her image, her outline is like her nice figure. You know, she's just, she's got a really beautiful figure. And so this captive woman captures the Israelite warrior's interest because she's beautiful of form. She's beautiful on the outside. So we're going to talk about the Yafat To'ar. And uh, if you look at this Torah portion, is this is the beginning. So here's the law. If you break this law, if, if you don't apply this law properly, then what you could end up with is uh, a hated wife. You could end up with a rebellious son. And that's what I mean by causality. This first thing starts something in motion. And if this is not applied properly, then it could lead to this, then it could lead to this, then it could lead to this and so forth. So we won't concentrate on that. But if you've never heard that before, then just bring that into the realm of your consciousness, that when the Torah wants to teach something, sometimes it builds up instead of out in terms of the real estate. It doesn't necessarily give you more and more and more and more and more details. Instead, by showing you the relationship among the words, you can put the details together yourself. And so in that, it's kind of building skyscrapers in the Torah scroll instead of having to use up more animal skins or parchment. And so, uh, you know, as we post past teachings and so forth. Uh, I think this week's teaching, it might have even had it on there in the public channel. But let's go uh, to another use of yatsa. And when we say kitetse, when you will go out, it's a future tense. The root of it is yatsa, not yatsi the game, but yatsa. Although I have to wonder if there's a correlation there. Give me something to think about if I ever play yatsi again. But yatsa, it means to go out or to bring out. Now, obviously, there's there's a much longer list of possible translations of it, but that's that's basic. It's functional. You get the idea. Bring it out to go out, um, moving from one realm to another. And so 
I wanted to give you this verse, Exodus 23, 16. And I think this is relevant because of when the Torah portion falls. And the Torah portion is always going to fall as we enter the fall of the year. It's falling right now in the month of Elul. And Elul is going to be the, the last of one calendar. It'll be the 12th month of one calendar. And then we'll start a new year in the seventh month. And we don't want to chase that rabbit down of why you can have a different beginning of the year, different beginning of the month. Uh, we'll do that some other time. But they're again, they're chiastic to one another. If you look at the first month, it's chiastic to the seventh month. And you, so you basically have feasts that are mirrors of one another. Um, it was the dog. I wasn't sure what that was. <laughs> He's usually right here. So here's what it says in Exodus 23, 16. It says, the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when you have gathered in your labors out of the field. Right. So there we have um, a phrase, Batset Hashana, at the going out of the year. And it's describing to us the fall feast season when you have the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and then you have Sukkot, which is called the Feast of Ingathering. But it's really all one little bundle of things, just like Pesach, you've got unleavened bread, you've got the first fruits of the barley. It's really one bundle. And so we know that in the month of Elul, which we are in, is going to be followed by the seventh month, the month of Tishrei. This is going to signal at the new moon at uh, Rosh Chodesh, it's also going to be Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, the Day of the Awakening Glass. It's got a half a dozen names. But at any rate, at this going out of the year, it talks about this is going to be a time where you have gathered in your labors. And as that year changes, because the Hebrew word for year is Shana. And when you bring it into English, it comes in as year. But the, the other meaning of that root, Shana, is to change. Something that changes or transforms. And so embedded within this, at the going out of the year, it's talking about at the going out of the change. So... All the seed that you have planted, that you have harvested, that you have gathered in, now you're going to bring it up to Sukkot. And so in that sense, there is a change that is coming. And so there's going to be a time of in-gathering, hint, 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 that is associated with this going out of the year or this changing of the year as the season changes. And so we get the same root word in our Torah portion, which is the title of the Torah portion, Kitetse. And it says, when you go out, Kitetse, to battle against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands, and you take them away captive, and you will see. And then it's going to go on. They talked about how you see this captive woman and you think she's beautiful and you think you want to marry her. But the emphasis right here in Kitetse, in the, in the opening sentence, is that when you will look at this captive and see that she is Yifat Tawar, that she's beautiful of form. And so what we want to do here is say there's something about the context of the going out of the year, the Feast of Trumpets, and how this Torah portion is placed. It's placed in the month, typically, prior to the Feast of Trumpets, which signals the resurrection of the dead of the greater body of Messiah. 
whatever's true in the, the spring in a smaller sense will be true in the fall in a, in a greater sense. And so we look forward to the, the resurrection of the body of Yeshua at the Feast of Trumpets. And so there's something in this Torah portion that is supposed to awaken us to the change of the year, to the going out of the year that is coming. And we're supposed to associate it with the ingathering of seed. Because that's what you're doing. When you bring in your crops, you're bringing in your seed. That's what wheat and barley is. It's seed. If you bring in fruit, it's got seed in it. So what you're bringing in are things that have seed in them. If that makes sense. That's where we're going. We're going to talk about the seedy side of love, right? So when we talk about love, we have to talk about the seed. So the idea here is as you bring this into the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of Asif, it's somehow related to when a, an Israelite warrior sees a captive woman and considers marrying her. Because this is um, the law of the captive woman is designed to terminate either in freedom for the captive woman, complete freedom, or marriage, so that she marries in and becomes an Israelite with full status. But what I want to do now, now that we, we've built another context for Yetza, let's go back and look at the first context for Yetza, which you know is the rule of first mention, right? And so we go all the way back to the third day of creation. You creation gospel fans who've been working on your paradigms and memorizing your days of creation all this time, it's about to pay off for you because you're going to see this before anybody else will. It says in Genesis 1.12, the earth brought forth vegetation. That word there for brought forth is totse. Again, it's uh, from Yatsa. The earth brought forth totse vegetation. Plants yielding seed. There's our seed again. After their kind. And trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Okay, you see the similarities. When you go out to war. The expectation is that when you go out to war as an Israelite, you're not looking at something that is intended to result in complete annihilation and destruction in certain cases. In some cases, you have to. But in others, you're permitted to take captives because truly the only hope for that enemy is for them to be captured. That's the only way they're going to have hope to hear the word. And so in that case, when you go out to war and when you see a captive woman, that she's a Yafat Tawar, she's gorgeous, compare that to the first mention of Yetza. When the earth brought forth, when what went out from the earth was good trees that bore fruit with seed in them vegetation that yields seed after their kind. And look, I mean, twice it says after their kind, after their kind. And if you read the entire passage, it's multiple after their kinds, especially when you get to the sixth day of creation. And so, <clears throat> again, we've got this relationship to the seed. When Elohim sees that it's good, the key characteristics are that it yields seed after their kind. When a plant bears seed after its kind, or if particularly a tree bears fruit with seed in it after their kind, Elohim sees that as good. And so we have to go back to our creation gospel paradigm. Trees are metaphors for human beings. Even before human beings were created on the sixth day, 
we have a prophecy of the sixth day on the third day because trees are metaphors of people. Even plants like grass can be metaphoric of how human beings absorb the word of Elohim. And so when Elohim sees these trees begin to come forth and they have seed that reproduces accurately according to its kind, then it says Elohim saw that it was tov in Hebrew tov. So reproducing seed according to your kind in the eyes of Elohim is tov. And in fact, it's very intensive when you read that in Hebrew. It says, Mazriah uh, zira, which means like seeding seed or sowing seed in order to make pregnant after their kind. And so when you compare this to its use in the going out of the year, then you can see that there's, again, a celebration of fruits and seeds that have the ability to re-sow themselves and to impregnate with seed that will bear according to its kind. It will breed true to its kind. And so when that happens, we can take this same Elohim saw that it was good on the third day of creation. We can apply that to the Feast of Sukkot. And when we bring seed and fruits with seed in them, and what do we know is our fruit? If we're, if we're not literally a farmer in the land of Israel, what fruit can we bring forth? The fruit of the Spirit. And so when you bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, there is seed in it. The seed is the word. Yeshua taught us. The seed is the word. And there's all sorts of things, bad things, that can happen to the seed of the word. One of the things you want to remember about the seed of the word is just like the seed of the Torah. He says, don't plant a field with mixed seed. Keep a field what it's supposed to be. If this is wheat, then it's wheat. If it's barley, then it's barley. But don't sow two types of crops together. Now, that, that doesn't really apply to your vegetable garden. But in terms of your seed crops, yes, he says, don't mix it. Because remember, what we want is for the seed to reproduce true to its kind. So if it reproduces true to its kind, then it can in turn impregnate and cause more fruit. And in this series of events, Elohim sees it and says, it's tov, it's good. It's not tov when we don't reproduce according to our kind. It's not tov when we mix two kinds of seed or two kinds of word in a field. And at the end of days, we know that Messiah is going to go through and make sure that the untruthful words, the tares, uh, they're going to be burned up. But it's only at the end of days that those tares will be completely and fully exposed as what they are. So the, the difference we see in the Torah portion and then the third day of creation is the difference between what we know is tov, what Elohim sees as tov, and then what you see as good, it's a maybe. I mean, the, the whole law of the Yafet Torah is to find out if what you have seen is truly good. Simply because it's beautiful on the outside, it doesn't tell us if the seed can reproduce according to its kind. <coughs> Whether you're about to attempt to sow mixed seed in the field, the seed of idolatry with the seed of holiness in order to produce mixed offspring. So there's a principle we could take away from that. What Elohim sees as tov or good may not be what human beings see as tov or good. But given free choice, because remember the captive woman, once she's brought into the house and kept there for a month, when she walks out that door, she's free. Regardless, she's free. He can't sell her. He can't put her to work. He has to let her go free if she chooses not to marry and she chooses not to abandon her foreign gods. 
But what we find out in this process is that given free choice, our view of what is tov can change in the same way that your tastes change. As you grow older, there might be certain foods that you loved when you were young and now you just don't care for them. Or there were certain things you're like, ooh, I would never put that in my mouth. And now you're like, ooh, you know, it's wonderful. Uh, smoked salmon, great. You know, raw fish. Um, so our viewpoint of what is tov can change. Elohim's viewpoint never changes. And the important thing for us to remember is what we view as tov will never change what is tov. The only thing that's going to change as it pertains to us is our viewpoint. What is tov is tov. It was established at the creation. So we can either choose to see the seed process as tov, the way Elohim does, or when we fall in love, when we have passion and desire for another human being, the deception is that passion and desire are truth. Passion and desire are not truth. They're emotions. He's not very passionate. It's not me. That's the wrong. Wake up. And so that's what we want to do is acquire Elohim's viewpoint of what is to because left to our own devices, just like the young warrior, if he were left to his own devices, number one, he might've raped the woman. Uh, in the, the, the heat of battle, that's not something they just did in ancient times. It still goes on today. The conqueror, um, not as a hard and fast rule, but as a general rule, they rape women and children when they conquer the, you know, their enemy, what they perceive to be their enemy. And so to this day, that's a vulnerability that people behave like beasts in the heat of war. So for an Israelite warrior, he's like, number one, no, you may not rape anybody. Even in the heat of war, it's not permissible. And so number two, if you think you want to marry this woman, let's find out if you're in love or if you're in lust. And I think that's what uh, Lady at our congregation said one time. She's got so much wisdom. I mean, it's mountain wisdom. It's beautiful wisdom. And she said, uh, people, who, uh, people who have puppy love, uh, I think, end up with fleas or something. <laughs> I, I'm sure I'm not quoting that right. But uh, no, people who start out with puppy love end up with a dog's life. And so the point is, in this passion that you have for the other person, is there a seed of spiritual truth? In other words, is this person following the same path of faith that you are? That's truth. It's based on it is written. And, and this is why Paul writes so extensively about not being unequally yoked. Because sometimes you become unequally yoked once you're in the marriage. You started out, you thought you were on the same page, and this may have happened to some of you. You come in, you, you know, maybe you're saved, maybe you come into Torah, and what you thought was being equally yoked, now you realize you're unequally yoked in some area. And so Paul gives lots of practical advice on how to deal with those situations because they frequently happen. But if you're going into a marriage, if, if you're looking at a potential partner for marriage, he's saying, go back to the principle of the seed. Is this of like kind and like mind? Because unless this person is of like kind and like mind, then the reproductive quality of that seed is in question. Because if you're just going to build it on love alone, passion alone, then what you might end up with is children who were confused. And it's not that you won't have confused children if you are equally yoked. Every child has to go and dig out, you know, their father's wills, just like Isaac did with Abraham's. But the problems can be exponentially worse when you have parents who are on different um, 
faith paths or one that's on a path of faith and one that's completely just not on board. And so, um, again, it's our job as we're even considering a marriage that we stop and say, wait a minute, what is Elohim's definition of Tov? And if I don't see that in this person first, then there's no sense in getting caught up in any emotion whatsoever, because that's something that sparks really fast. And, you know, we're, we're talking about processing with the mind, and that rarely happens when you fall in love, right? Uh, but there's a recognition here that uh, passion is a strong emotion. It's not truth. Truth is based on it is written. It comes from a spiritual source. But the passion comes from the animal soul, the nefesh, the thing that you have in common with an animal. Animals are very passionate, even if it's just for a nap in their favorite spot. But this is beast-like. And so that's why I say with your spiritual part of you, you have to say, this is what is permitted for me to be passionate about. And this is what is not permitted. This is what is Tov and this is what is not Tov. Now, if I look at this person and he or she, depending on who I am, they look really good. Okay. They're handsome. They're beautiful. They're nice of form. If their walk of faith is in the realm of truth, in the realm of the good seed, then Yes, we might look into that relationship within the guidelines. And then having the person to be beautiful or handsome and beautiful of form, you know, young, thin, and beautiful or whatever, big, strong, and handsome, that's just kind of like something that's in spite of what Elohim sees as tov. And so it might be an added bonus. But the thing is, if you see the spiritual beauty of someone, it can make the outward form also seem beautiful to you. So we have to, um, let's follow up. Let's talk about this passion. Because the Torah does recognize, in spite of the dangers of taking a foreign woman as a wife, and there's a spiritual principle that's being applied here, even though it's warning of a huge potential for danger, because they've already seen this before, uh, when the Moabite and the Midianite women came out to seduce the Israelite warriors, and it was so easy, that they didn't even have to shoot an arrow. <laughs> Battle was over. They were committing idolatry. They were committing adultery. Even though there's the danger of this with foreign women, it creates this law of the Yafat Tawar in spite of. See, if, it, it was, if there was no redeeming quality in this whatsoever, then all he has to say is no foreign women period, the end. But he doesn't say that. He says, here's a process for you and the potential bride to get to the heart of what is tov or what is lotov, not good. So we continue reading. And you see among the captives a beautiful woman and have a desire, a uh, chashak for her and would take her as a wife for yourself. Right now, this the, the Hebrew word for love that you're probably familiar with is ohev or ahava. In this case, it's a different word. It's cheshak. And it's a very strong emotion. And cheshak means to set your love upon someone or to delight in someone. And you can see in the context that this delight or this passion, this setting of your love upon is based on the outward appearance, the tawar, the outward form, the image of the person. Here's the problem. You can be a person who is beautiful of form. You can have the best figure, you can have the best muscles, you can have the most handsome or the most beautiful face, but you can be very ugly on the inside. And so there's a process here so that you can find out whether your attraction to this woman is merely her outward appearance or whether there's a spark of something else. Because if, if you read the, the little summary of the 
the Torah portion, you saw that I said it has some relationship to the lost tribes of Israel. And we'll get to that. Um, but these, it's, it's kind of like telling your kids you can't do something at all. Well, being human beings, most kids will want to do it just because you tell them they can't do that. And so, however, if you say, okay, I'm not telling you you can't do that. You can do that if you do this, 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 and this. If you can do these five things, then you can have that. And what that does, it just kind of sucks some of the energy out of the, I'll do it just because you don't want me to. So we can see that the father's kind of doing the same thing to the Israelite warrior. Okay, I understand you're caught up in the heat of war. You're passionate. You see a beautiful woman. I'm not telling you you can't have her. I'm telling you, you can marry her, not rape her. You can marry her if you do this, 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 and this. If you do these five things, if you check out these boxes, and then part of it's interactive. If she doesn't cooperate, then the deal's off anyway. What is he doing? He's, he's giving the soldier time to see the real woman, to see the woman inside. And so now everything's going to change. She's going to have to go into a month of mourning for her parents. And she's going to, it says, uh, take off the garments of her captivity. What does that mean? Uh, you saw with the Moabite and the Midianite women, what they would do is they would dress up in the best clothes, the best jewelry, the best hairdos, and before the battle, they would go out and they would try to seduce the, the enemy warrior. And like I said, with, with Midian and Moab, there was no arrow even shot in order to seduce them. They offered them this, this wonderful meal. They offered them free love and, you know, something pretty. And before they knew it, Israel had descended into idolatry, which is why Moab and Midian are judged much more harshly after the fact than Edom, who came out with a sword, because the understanding is Edom just wanted to take your natural life. The Moabites and the Midianites were trying to take your after life. They were trying to corrupt you with idolatry, and the consequences of that are much more important than just losing your physical life. And so... Uh, even with this prohibition, now she comes in, she has to take those clothes off, the jewelry, the finery, the beautiful, wonderful dress that she dressed up in, all that's removed. Now she's in sackcloth. She's in a state of mourning. So you wear ugly clothes when you're in mourning. Her head is shaved. So if you were attracted because her hair was beautiful, now it's not. She's going to have her face, her eyes, they're going to be red and swollen from crying and grieving over her parents and the life that she's left behind that she's never going to see again that in the rearview mirror, it looked like a big fire. So if her eyes and her face were beautiful, now they're going to be ugly. She's not going to get any manicures or pedicures. There's really nothing about her at this point that's left to desire based on her outward form. And she's brought into the midst of the house, it says. And so pretty much she's right there underfoot, crying, being sad. I mean, who wants to be around a sad person? I mean, that's such a, you know, downer. And she's right there in the middle of the house. You trip over every time you try to do something. And she's just sitting there crying or sitting there being sad or, or thinking about the way that it used to be. And in a month, you might change your mind. Because if it was based on outward appearance, not much to be desired. If you were thinking, well, maybe she's got a wonderful personality, but all you've ever seen was her grieving well, maybe her personality won't appear so wonderful to you. She's mourning. And so what this takes away is the kind of being seduced by the form, by the, the toar part of what you've seen, the form, the outline, because the form of the outline really doesn't tell you what's inside the person. 
This is also giving the woman a month to adjust, obviously, to a completely new life. But this is a learning time because at the end of this month, she's, she's going to know. If I'm not willing to put away my foreign idols and to embrace this one God of Israel, then at the end of the month, I just got to hang in there and I'm going to go free. And if she knows that, you know, she can just sit around and be sad for a month. But she's given time for the family, assuming that this warrior is still living with his parents, maybe, if he's not been married before. And she has a chance to be influenced by an Israelite family and to see the laws of Israel enacted around her. And that's what the promise was that came with the Torah is that the nations around you are going to look at you and say, wow, what a wise and wonderful God the Israelites must be serving. We want to be part of that. It gives them an idea instead of going out to the nations to be a light. This little one person from a nation has come into your house. And if you can't demonstrate the light in your own house, then my goodness, where can you demonstrate it? And so she has the opportunity to consider a new way of life because at the end of the month, if she agrees to marry the man and to reject the idols, she is now a full fledged Israelite wife with all the obligations and responsibilities that go along with it. And so even though she's a captive, she's two kinds of captive. She's been taken captive in war and then She's also a captive to idolatry. This is a heritage handed down to her from her parents. And so she's not just mourning that she's a physical captive. We sometimes, if we are unwillingly or willingly taken away from our faith foundation, then we will go through a period of mourning. And if you don't believe that's true, then all you have to do is get on social media and scan through there a little bit. And what will you see? People whining and crying and being angry and having temper tantrums about the church. Or they'll be crying and whining about the wonderful things they left behind in the church where everybody just loved one another and people weren't really hung up on the details. We have all different kinds of ways of going through a process of grieving and mourning a system that we left behind that was handed down to us probably from our parents. And if you notice people who really don't have a, a background in a church, maybe their parents didn't go to church or whatever, so they didn't grow up with that system, they tend to spend much less time worried about what the church is doing or not doing. But for people who have spent their whole lives in church and their parents and their parents and their parents going all, they've got this deep spiritual heritage. And so when they begin to, to move in a different direction, which by the way has been happening for thousands of years now, each generation takes it a little bit farther and advances it a little bit farther. But you can see that they're still connected to that because they won't shut up crying. I mean, you get a month, have your funeral, grieve what you left behind, grieve all the wonderful systems that were in place for your convenience, all the wonderful youth services that they had, all the wonderful children's Sunday school things that they had and the children's choir and the adult choir and the full stringed instruments that they had for praise and worship how you could go to three different services so that it was more convenient. You just pick the time that you like. And seriously, you can cry for that for a month, but you have to understand you're on an adventure now. You're moving into brand new territory. You're moving into something where you can take the good things that you learned in church. You can bring your salvation. What did Yeshua do? He rescued you from the realm of death. That's a great foundation to build on right there. So don't be angry with the church who gave you a foundation of salvation. 
And that didn't make any sense. Why are you mourning for something that you really don't have to leave behind? It's foundational. So you were rescued from the realm of death, but now you're in a different stage. You're not just rescued from death. You're in a specific spot. He's brought you into the house so that you can look around you and begin to learn the Torah and to decide whether you just want to go free on your own and be independent or whether you want to become a bride. And if you want to become a bride, you got to get over yourself. You got to get over the, the grief. You got to get over the anger, all the feelings that we have when we have to separate from something in the past and move on to something new. And because we never give it a burial, we never shut up about it. And the more people talk badly of the church, the more I realize they're just being ugly. They're just sitting there crying and being ugly. And it's hard for the bridegroom to look at a bride that does nothing more than sit around and cry or be angry about what she left behind. That's a tough stage for us to get through, but we have to get through it because if we're going to go forward, we have to turn loose of all the wonderful things that we thought we had back there. Remember the, the every green tree, all the conveniences that you had back there? Well, there will be some inconveniences in your future. Have your little cry and then quit. Don't worry about what the church is doing. You're going forward. You need to learn the ways that you're going to be responsible for if you were a bride so that that's who you become. Because, you know, seriously, the best testimony you can give to the people that you left behind is that light that the Israelites were supposed to have where it says the other nations are going to look at you and say, wow, what a wise and wonderful God they serve. We don't want the nations to look at us and say, wow, they're really been out of shape about something. What is it? We got to send the right message that we're excited about the future, not that we love crying about the past. And so um, you have to hand it to Yeshua. He hangs in there with us. He's really patient. He's like, oh, my bride's so ugly on the outside. But I know there's a spark of holiness inside of her. That's what I saw in her. I saw the potential that she could reproduce according to my kind. That if I brought her into my house, if I brought her into my field, then once she got done being mad, sad, whatever, and she started living according to her destiny in my house, then she would become beautiful again, but in a much different way. In fact, that little spark of holiness that I saw in her, it's going to flame up. And that's how she's going to be also that light to the nations that I'm calling her to be. And so I just don't think it's random. I don't know if it's divine, but I don't think it's random. The, the Torah reading, again, comes in this month of Elul, which means a, a vain nothingness. And so if you look at this captive woman, you're like, it's kind of a vain nothingness. I mean, all she does is sit around and cry all the time and, and wear ugly clothes. <laughs> and so uh, it's preparing you for the Feast of Trumpets that's coming at the first of the next month, at the month of Tishrei. Because what's going to happen with this captive woman, she's grieving what is dead and what needs to die in her as well. And I think that's part of why people just go on and on and on bad-mouthing the church. I think they're also in the process of grieving what has to die in themselves. That's hard to admit sometimes, that there's still things in me that have to die. You know, that, you know, I, I found the Torah and I thought the whole world would change because I found it. And as it turns out, it's not a land flowing with milk and honey, but it is. It's because of all the things you cannot see that you knew there is a land flowing with milk and honey. But I'm only going to see it when I see as Elohim sees what is tov. And so this is what is changing in the house. Yeshua brings us into the house, so our viewpoint of tov can change. And so 
uh, she has the opportunity here to no longer be a captive to her past. She has an opportunity here to go free in more ways than one. Not only will she be free of her literal captivity from being captured in a war, but she's going to be free from the idolatry. So even though it's the law of the captive woman, it's actually the law of the free woman. If she takes the opportunity and if he takes the opportunity. And so going out, when you go out, what's supposed to go out? Well, in Elohim's viewpoint, if you start growing trees with fruit, with seed in them that grow according to their kind, then it's tov. It's tov. That's how you're supposed to go out. And what are we doing when we bring the captive woman into the house for a month? We're weeding out the seed of the woman. Remember, males have seed, but females do too. Uh, the Torah portion, Tazria, it literally means when she sows seed. And then we get the prophecy of the seed of the woman back in Genesis. So the woman is also contributing a seed. And it's going to have to be the seed of the woman that eventually bruises the head of the serpent. So she's vital to this process. Who you marry is vital to this process. And so you can weed out the seed of the woman that might produce idolatry um, and rebellion. Because remember the causality premise. You could come up with a rebellious son out of this marriage. You could come up and come to hate this wife. Um, what else is there in there? Uh, divorce is in here. There's all sorts of things that, that might crop up if you short circuit this process. We don't want her to become a, a hated wife. We don't want you to produce a rebellious son. And so um, it's, it's actually thought that Absalom, I don't know if you remember the story of Absalom. It's in 2 Samuel chapter three, look before, look after. But around that neighborhood of 2 Samuel chapter three, uh, we get information about David's wives. And we're told his, uh, his sons and his wives, like in an order, because he had multiple ones. It says uh, his, meaning David's second, Chiliath by Abigail, the widow, widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom of Shalom, the son of Ma'akah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. And so there's a, a tradition here. I don't know that you're going to find it specifically in scripture. Now you get some hints, especially once Absalom has Amnon killed for raping his sister Tamar. And there's going to be a little connection there with, with the word. Um, but after Absalom runs away, once Amnon is killed and he knows that King David is very upset, we're told that he goes back to his maternal grandfather's house in Geshur, which is going to be like in the north around the area of Bashan and so forth. Uh, we know that when Absalom or Absalom, which means father of peace, by the way, and as it turned out, he was a rebellious son. And he brought anything but peace to his father. He leads a civil war against King David. He rapes David's concubines on the palace roof. Um, and in the commentary, the, the Midrash says that this uh, wife, Ma'aka, Absalom's mother, was a Yafat Tawar, that she was captured in war. And in order to kind of make the peace and so forth, that Ma'aka was part of the deal uh, with the king of Geshur. And that even though she married David, it was a coerced marriage. David fell for her very passionately. Remember the word there is cheshak. And he set his affection upon her. But on her end, it wasn't necessarily free will. She was a piece of property being exchanged by her father. 
And so it says that she submitted to this marriage out of fear, but because it was out of fear and not free will, this spark of idolatry remained in her. And then this, this impurity of the seed shows up in Absalom because the marriage wasn't born out of peace. See, even if you go back to uh, the story of Isaac and Rebecca, the servant goes and wants to know if Rebecca will go back with him and marry Isaac. Even then, her family calls her in and says, will you go with this man? In other words, don't be like the Nephilim who are taking and giving, basically just trafficking. Whatever they want, they take it. It said, you know, taking whomever they desired. It wasn't a matter of, will you take so-and-so to be your, it wasn't that. They just took the women. And so uh, in this case, that's what we see. It's not completely free will like Rebecca. She says, yes, I'll go. We'll leave now. That's free will. That's without coercion. And um, when we place our passion, our cheshach, when we place our passion above the Torah, then the, the odds increase. That's why the Torah didn't just say, no, you can't do this. You can't marry a captive woman. It says you can if you go through this process so we can weed out the bad seed because she will never consent to leaving behind her idols if she's completely, completely committed to that lifestyle. You know, our tendency tends to be, well, they might be a heathen, but we'll get married and I'll change him. Or we'll get married and I'll, she'll change. Well, the odds, there's a possibility. But it's more of a warning than a recommendation as it concerns the Yafat Tawar. And so, you know, when we say, oh, oh, I know there's a spark of spirituality in them. Uh, I know there's something good in there. Well, yeah, there's a spark of something good in every human being. But whether that spark's ever going to be anything more than a little spark, the father knows. And so he set up a procedure to give us an opportunity to investigate that spark and to find out whether it's just more of chashak. We have passion for the outward form. It's like, oh, man, this, this guy looks good or this girl looks good. I got to have them. He wants to know if your first question is, tell me about your faith. Do you know Yeshua? Do you read your Bible? Do you know anything about Shabbat? And it may be that that's a talking place. Maybe they've never heard of Shabbat before. That might be a great place to increase their faith. But if you know that person is not walking in faith, then wisdom dictates that you not be intimate with that person until the decision is made. Because there's no sense in getting caught up in passion if you can't come to that agreement of the spiritual minds. And so we, we do see Absalom rebelling against his father. And here's irony. It's because his half-brother Amnon rapes Dina. Here's another rape, a woman being forced. And so we know Amnon looked at Dina and she was Yafa. She was beautiful. This is, you hear Yafa Tawar, she was a beautiful of form. Well, Amnon looks at Dina and says, oh, wow, she is Yafa. She is beautiful. I am in love. Well, he was not in love because he hated her the minute he was done with her. He set his love on her, but he didn't love her. She was an object of beauty to him. And so this same word, chashak, describes the love with which it says Shechem loved Dina. Oh, excuse me. Amnon raped Tamar. I'm getting my rapes mixed up. This is really weird. Um, and then Shechem rapes Dina. And so the word Cheshach that applies to Shechem the way that he felt about Dina, this is the same passion that the Israelite warrior feels when he sees this captive woman. That he thinks, oh, i got to marry her. She's beautiful. Well, that's what Shechem thought about Dina. He rapes her. He professes his love. I mean, he's not like Amnon. He doesn't hate her the second it's done. He wants to marry her. But don't miss this in the text. 
he did not release the girl back to her father and brothers during the, the negotiation of the marriage contract. He did not release her. She's still in a state of coercion. She should have been returned to her family. And so in both situations, the rape of Tamar, the rape of Dina, free will was denied to the girl in both situations. And when that happens, the repercussions can extend through generation after generation after generation. The message, violence against women is counter to the covenant. Free will is what leads you into the covenant. And it has to be part of the yafat to our marriage. Because either way, remember at the end, she's free. She's free to go about her own idolatry as she pleases, or she is free to walk in the perfect tour of liberty and freedom. And so you need this, this time period and this procedure to set apart and to find out the true form of what this marriage might be. We don't want like Dina for the girl to be chained to the potential bridegroom's desire. It can't be a matter of coercion. And, and typically when that happens, when it is just animal beastly desire, um, when it's over, it's like Amnon. There's no respect for the woman afterward. And in this case, it was intense hatred that he had for Tamar afterward. Rape is never permitted. A coerced marriage is never permitted because there's an increased likelihood that the offspring may inherit the corruption of that reproductive act. Now, it's not 100% true. I mean, not true. It is 100% true. It's not 100% that's what will happen. He's saying, I'm warning you, this is what can happen. So in spite of the risk, in spite of the warning, the Torah is establishing the Yafat Tawar because there is something about this process that is tov. There's something about this process that can be tov. Um, remember, one of the, the people groups that was prohibited to the Israelites, it says, you know, they may not enter the, the, the congregation, the Moabites, because of what they did with the, the idolatry and the adultery in the wilderness. And how they didn't greet you with bread and water. They had no sense of hospitality. Um, but then we see Ruth, who is a Moabitess, and she goes through what we would in modern day terms, I don't think they had any such term in, in ancient times, but in modern terms, she undergoes a conversion. She leaves the, the gods and the land of the Moabites. She follows Naomi. And she takes on the one Elohim of Israel. And how do we know this is going well? Because the, the, the period here um, it, it doesn't really fall according to the, the captive woman idea um, because it's completely voluntary. But it's showing you the difference in the offspring because... When Ruth does come in and start working so hard, it's, if you can read the text closely in Hebrew, you realize she knows the intricacies of gleaning. And the Torah, it's especially if you read it in Hebrew, it's very specific, specific about what you can pick up, how much you can pick up, where you can pick up. And Ruth does a series of things that you only catch if you know those things. Uh, and you can see that it's not just random. It's not like Naomi just said, well, go out and find a field and, and go behind the, the harvesters. She's very precise in what she chooses to do, even the position in which she chooses to do it. Uh, out of modesty, you'll notice that she goes behind the harvesters as they're working, as they're gathering the sheaves together. Why? She's not bending over in front of the harvesters. Um, She's not putting herself in an immodest position. And so Boaz notices how pointed 
her observance is. It's not as though she's a foreigner. It's obvious she's a foreigner for some reason, maybe the way that she dresses or something, or he knows she's not from around there. And something I pointed out to the, the online classes earlier was that in Bethlehem, just like any other area at that time, we're still in the period of the judges, families and clans settled in areas. So it's kind of like, you know, where I'm from in Arkansas, if you go back three generations, I think they're all related at some point. And so a particular clan might settle a particular area. And so over time, they're, they're pretty much one big family. Remember, it caused such a huge uproar when Naomi and Ruth come in because everybody knows her because she's family. And so everybody has to know who Ruth is. Nevertheless, Boaz is asking questions about her. And, you know, some commentaries say he was still in mourning for his, his wife who had died. And that's why he didn't notice when she came in. He says, well, who is she? Because what she's doing is very, you have to have a detailed knowledge of the Torah to even know how to glean properly. And so he starts asking questions. But if you notice, he tells her, you know, why did, when, when she asks him to, you know, cover your handmaiden, she's asking for a marriage. And he says, you know what? You could have any of these young men. You could have any of these rich men. Why are you going after an old man like me? I think we get the idea at that point that both of them have mastered the concept of the Yafat Tawar. They weren't looking at the outward appearance. Ruth didn't see an old man. Boaz didn't see just a beautiful young woman. He saw a, he calls her a woman of valor, just like in Proverbs 31, in the city gates before the elders, and it's confirmed, she's a woman of valor. So what is he looking for? That which is tov, that which Elohim sees as tov. He says, this woman can reproduce after the kind of the seed. And remember, the seed is the word. It's the devar. And so the seed of this woman is different from the other Moabitess women. And they say that was the, the key event that helped the Israelites to interpret what does it mean that the, the Moabite cannot enter the congregation. And so they, they looked very closely at the wording of it and said, well, you know what? It says, like, if we were speaking Hebrew, Moabite, the males, but it doesn't say anything about the females. And so if the females are willing to convert or to put away their foreign idols, there's no reason why a Moabite female cannot enter the congregation. And they say that was the turning point and them understanding that particular law. And we know that she comes, she goes on to become the ancestress of King David because her seed was true. And she did not marry based on how handsome and how young and how strong Boaz was. She married him because he was a righteous man. You see how he greets his workers? I mean, he invokes the name. He invokes the sacred name over them and blesses them. And so that's what she's looking for. She's looking for that kinsman redeemer uh, who is going to rescue her. And at the same time to redeem the field. Of Naomi, because remember, as the, the properties would have been adjacent to one another, and Boaz recognized the importance of this field that most likely is adjacent to his and his immediate. You know, like I say there was one other relative who could have redeemed it, and then he said, Oh no, I can't redeem it if the girl goes with the field. Uh, but having that property not broken up was so important to Boaz. And, you know, this is how Ruth approaches it. Why break up an inheritance in the land? And so she even appreciates these laws of inheritance and succession. So um, I, I think the point here is they weren't looking at the outward form. The beauty that they saw was something on the inside. And, um, you know, here's what she says in Ruth 2.10. She 
She fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband, after the death of your husband. See, if it was just about marrying into the family and doing Shabbat or doing a few things just because she was married to Mahlon, well, that would have stopped after he died. Like, if I was just doing it for the sake of my husband or getting along with my mother-in-law and father-in-law, well, Shabbat would have been over. Every bit of Torah that she learned, that would have stopped. But instead, he says, after the death of your husband, it's like it's increased. And he says, it's been fully reported to me and how you left your father and mother, just like the captive woman and the land of your birth, and came to a people that you did not previously know. And so that's, that's awesome. He says, all that you have done, and at one point he says, your last kindness is greater than the first one. In other words, you're growing in Torah. You are reproducing true seeds in my field, and, and I want you to be my wife. And, uh, and that's what he says in uh, Ruth 3, 9, and 10. He, she says, spread your covering over your maid for your close relative, you're a goel. And he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after the young man, whether poor or rich. This is the concept. Don't go for the outward appearance. Don't go what's most beautiful to the natural eye because look at the inheritance that Boaz and Ruth left King David in Bethlehem. And so Boaz accepts, really, it's, he doesn't object. She says, you are a close relative, Boaz. Spread your covering over me. He doesn't object when she says that. Because if he had not already accepted her as a member of the family, he would have said, oh, no, no, I am not your close relative. All he says is, well, there's actually one in the succession that's closer, but I'm going to go do right now. <laughs> Here, take this barley. I'm going to walk you to town, and I'm going to go do what I have to do in the city gates to get permission to marry you. So just trust me. I'm going to give you this barley as, as a good faith gift. Take this to Naomi. But he does not disagree that he is a relative, and that's huge. She's gone from being a foreigner, from an idolatrous place, from a forbidden nation, and now he's calling her daughter, just like, a, like his own daughter, which is a, a term of endearment. Um, the Torah is called the king's daughter, that it's that dear to him, like a child, um, that he wants to protect. And so he says, you know what, your kindness is just getting better because he said, you could have gone after the young men, and instead, what are you doing? You're trying to maintain Naomi's inheritance so that she will not lose it. And Naomi was apparently a cranky lady. <laughs> Can you imagine serving a cranky lady? <laughs> Learning Torah from a cranky lady? Well, maybe you think you are. I don't know. But <laughs> at any rate, she wasn't an easy person to be around. She just wanted to grieve and mourn and carry on. But in Ruth, she sees hope that Hmm. Maybe there's a future here. And if you'll notice, it says that Naomi nursed Obed. It doesn't say that Ruth nursed the baby. It says that Naomi nursed him. She had a type of a resurrection. Uh, and so seeking a holy marriage has to be set above seeking a beautiful marriage. You have to seek what is more than chashak. It has to be more than emotional love deep. It can't be just soul deep, how I feel about you and how I'm obsessed with you day and night, that soul deep. But when it's spiritual deep, it's very similar because remember Boaz is like, remember what Naomi says? She says, he, the man is not going to rest until he takes care of this. Why? His spirit had been aroused with her compassion, with her kindness, with her deeds of Torah. And he's like, this 
is a seed that's going to reproduce tov. It's going to reproduce after its kind. So let's see what else we want to say about this. We know that um, we don't want to do the deliberate marriage. That's too far to go. Um, here, I wanted to give you another context. Um, Remember we read Exodus 23, 16, which used Yatza as the season of Sukkot, the season of the going out of the year. Remember at, at that season at Yom Kippur, they're going to blow the shofar for the Yovel year. You've got the Shemitah year is marked at that time. So it's called the going out of the year, but it's also called the Tkufa of the year. Uh, what's the question? Shot, yeah, that's good. If you're going to transliterate it, I don't have the, the Hebrew keyboard on here. Uh, but if we take that verse of Exodus 23, 16, describing the, the going out of the year, it has a twin that also describes it. And this is Exodus 34, 22. It says, and you shall observe the feast of weeks, which is Shavuot, the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of end gathering. It says at the year's end. Now it says that in English. In Hebrew, that's tkfa, tkfa. And the book of Ruth is read at the feast of the week at the Feast of Weeks, by the way. It's read at Shavuot because it spans the period from the barley harvest at Passover into the Feast of Weeks at Shavuot in the beginning of the summer. And so it places these things together. Observe this, this time. And the tekufa then would be an equivalent expression to Yatsa, not identical. It's not the same as, but equivalent to. It's, it's giving you a different aspect of understanding Yatsa or the going out of the year. In this particular case, described as the Tekufa of the year, we know, first of all, that it is a time of ingathering at Sukkot, that it's going to in gather what Elohim sees as tov, seed that reproduces after its kind, fruit with the seed in it that will reproduce according to its kind. It's also part of a circuit because the definition of tekufa is a revolution going around in a circle, uh, a circuit. It can also mean the end. And so what's going on? There is a cycle and there is a circuit of bringing in the seeds that should be true to kind. Now, <clears throat> we know Yeshua is our bridegroom. He sent his disciples, I believe, to seek out the Yafat Tawars of the world. Is the whole world going to accept his seed, his word? Probably, <coughs> according to statistics, a very small number. And they will accept it at different levels. For instance, you might have one captive who says, well, you know, I can worship this, this God of yours, but could I also keep a few of my own? Well, I like a lot of these laws in your Torah, but I have a few of my own. Could I add those? Or there's some of those I just don't really care for. Could we take a few of those out? And see, so she, she very subtly changes the young man's agreement with Elohim's view of good or tov. And she says, actually, I make up my own version of tov. And in all honesty, don't we all do that to some extent when 
we don't do good when we're we're supposed to do it, or we do things we know we're not supposed to do. Paul even talked about that. And so the spirit is here to help us make that transformation so that we can do the things that we're supposed to do and that we can stop doing the things we're not supposed to do. And that remember what's Tov doesn't change. We start changing. And our view of Tov now starts being molded according to his vision. But after 2000 years, after sending his disciples out into the world to seek out the Yifat Tawars, he's trying to take captives. But there's the, there's the fun thing about being a captive of Yeshua. It's really that you're captivated by him. It's a free will thing. He brings you into the house and he says, you know what? You're free already. You have to sit here for a month. Really, you're free already, but you get to choose which freedom you want. You are free to go back to the way that you used to live. Or you are free to walk in covenant with me, with my land, with my covenant, with my people. You can do that. Either way, you're free. It's free will. I don't want to coerce you. I don't want to pressure you. I mean, you can mention hellfire and damnation, but I don't know that that's really an enduring fix. I don't know if that's a proper motivation. But the, the beauty of the word, he says, I want you to fall in love with me. I want you to fall in love with the word of Adonai. I want you to begin to see Tov. I want you to begin to see real Tov, real good, something beyond your surface passions. Because see, when your, your life is conducted based on the, the chashak, the, first, the surface passion, and, and like Lola said, you know, if you start out with puppy love, you're liable to end up with a dog's life because it was passion. It burns very quickly. And, and my analogy is it lasts until the batteries run out because see, it's not coming from an, an internal source. You know, Yeshua says, you know, this well, the, the well of the Holy Spirit, it's never going to run out. You don't need batteries. Right? Will you go through seasons of ups and downs? You betcha. That's just part of the plan. But in terms of that, that ever-flowing spring, that's always going to be there. So you don't need batteries to, to fall in love with, with the Torah. It's coming from an internal that internal spark that the warrior saw in the captive woman. He saw that captive woman among all these captives, and he said, there's something in her that's beautiful. I can only really see the outline of it right now, but there's something in that woman that's beautiful and I am passionate for it. But this is not the kind of passion that's going to wear out the second I see her with her head shaved and sackcloth and ashes with ugly fingernails and sitting around with her swollen crying eyes over what she left behind that we, we know is the realm of death. He's like, no, there's something in her that needs to come out because see, he's, the kinsman redeemer. And if he's the kinsman redeemer, he's saying, wait a minute, that's family. That's family. She's in the clan. She's in the tribe going way, way back. There's a reason she's standing out to me because I'm supposed to go free her. See, she was a captive when I found her. My job is going to be to free her. I'm going to bring her into my house and let her discover who she really is. And, and here's what Orthodox Judaism says about this particular law, the, the law of the Yefat Toar. They say that when this law is applied in the proper way and the, they end up marrying, it's a sign, it says in the Midrash, that this woman was destined to be converted. She was destined to come into the Torah because of, out of all the captives, she's the one who captured his eye. That it turned out that it was more than her outward form that attracted him. He was actually attracted to her 
in spite of how beautiful she was, if that makes sense. See, when, when that's the spark that you see, when you see that which is good, sometimes it's in spite of how beautiful the person is on the outside because you're, you're forcing yourself to look beyond how handsome or how pretty she is. You're looking in there and you're saying, wow, I'm like, well, yeah, it doesn't look bad on the outside either. <laughs> but they say this woman, it was, it was who she was. And that's why this law is in place, because there are Israelites out there in the nations, they say, that need to be brought back in. And the way that they're going to be brought back in is through the principle of this particular law, the law of the Yafat Tawar. And it says on page 266, it says, coming from a standpoint of Judaism, it says, today we may marry Gilim, strangers, from all nationalities since the conqueror Sennacherib, the, the Assyrian king, dispersed the nations from their lands of origin. And therefore, we can no longer identify restricted nations. So what are they saying? The moment that Assyria deported from among the 10 tribes, repopulated, and then started scattering people around the empire, they say at that moment, we lost track of who we could and couldn't marry. And they say that was a divine purpose. And so that to this day, because of that mixing up of the Assyrians, that today a Jew may marry anyone who out of free will, and by the way, they'll discourage them three times, like Ruth, Naomi tried to turn Ruth back three times, and they say if somebody tries to convert to Judaism, they'll, they'll reject them three times. And if they still come back, then they'll, they'll go through the conversion process. It's based on that, that model. But they say it's because of this law that they understand that this is how the Israelites that have been removed from the family for what, around 3,000 years now? This is a, a, a way of seeing how they come back. And I don't know about you, but that makes me very happy that regardless of whether I'm a lost tribal person or whether I'm like Ruth, the Moabitess who was descended from an incestuous relationship, regardless of which situation you were born into, it doesn't matter whether you go on the, the warrior in love model or whether you go on the old man Boaz model, you can still be incorporated into the covenant if you go through the process. There, there's still a process in place. You have to leave behind the idols of your past. You have to strip everything that you're proud of on the outside so that what's on the inside can be revealed to your bridegroom. And it's because of your bridegroom that you're going to become beautiful again in the right way so that you are tov in the eyes of Elohim not just in the eyes of your, your potential bridegroom, but you, you also want to be beautiful in the eyes of the father. Remember how Boaz called her my daughter? So we, we, we've done step one. We've been saved. Death has been conquered on our behalf. So we've been rescued from the realm of death. Step one's down. Now the bridegroom brings us into his house. He wants to strip us down. And some days we feel more stripped than others. <laughs> and we take off those beautiful garments, exterior garments that we thought we had. And as we go through this period of mourning, the promise is, you know what? When you resurrect from this on the first of Tishrei, you are going to have on such beautiful white garments 
at that time. It's going to be a type of resurrection. This marriage is going to, to typify for us the resurrection from the dead. But right now, it feels like we're sitting in the groom's house, just sitting around crying a lot. <laughs> because we keep thinking about the things we left behind. And I think COVID's been part of this experience this year. Because we keep talking about normal, because normal is all we ever know. And so when we're offered progress, it's scary, because progress usually comes with war. And like I say, the world just gets uglier around us. And that can be scary, seeing what's going on around us. But at the same time, understand you're sitting in the groom's house. You're being given time to sort through everything, to get over the war. And we used to say that down south, like he doesn't know the war's over. <laughs> He's still fighting the war. And, and we be, sometimes we do that. We get so caught up. And things that no longer pertain to us, just none of our business anymore. And rather than learning what's ahead of us and accepting what an honor it is to be brought into the groom's house, even if, yeah, sometimes we're still <laughs> sitting around with swollen red eyes. <laughs> this is not a land flowing with milk and honey. My boss hates me and my kids don't listen to me. And my family thinks I'm crazy. And my friends don't know why I don't do anything with them on Saturday anymore. You know, and they had such great youth programs in church. And now I just don't even know who my kids are going to marry. This is awful. It's just awful. Wow. Okay, beauty. <laughs> Clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> when you get over mourning what you've left behind and when you're willing to work on what's ahead of you maybe you're the one that's going to build that wonderful youth program that's going to connect Torah youth around the world or maybe you're the one that's going to come up with that wonderful children's curriculum that Torah kids around the world can use Maybe you're the one that's going to start singing in your fellowship and doing praise and worship. I don't know. I don't know. But until you start seeing it as something ahead of you instead of something that was provided for you conveniently behind you, it's probably going to be real difficult for the bridegroom to work up any real passion. <laughs> so wipe your eyes. Start thinking about the first of Tishrei, the first of the seventh month. It's approaching very fast. Think about the resurrection from the dead and think of all the things that we need to bury this month. Remember, Elul, its, it's theme is vain nothingness. And so if there's anything in your life that you would, in final evaluation, say, you know what, my bridegroom probably doesn't want this in his house. Okay, throw it into the vain nothingness drawer. And, and at the end of the month, you know, dump that vain nothingness drawer. Uh, the decision's ours. He gave us free will. We get to decide how much of that old junk we want to hold on to that is going to corrupt the seed that he's planting in us. But the more of that junk we let go of in the past the easier it is for the word, the seed that he's planting in us to reproduce according to his kind in the image of Elohim so that what's being produced in us is tov as he sees it, not as we see it. And we're going to have to be brave. Sometimes it's not easy letting go of what's behind us. It just seems like sometimes our future is just entirely a product of what's behind us. And that can be true in a good way. If you start seeing the things behind you as foundations to where you are today and what your next step is, don't be ashamed of what's behind you. Don't be mad <laughs> about what you have behind you and who betrayed you. I mean, can you imagine that woman sitting in the house for a month 
going back over the battle and thinking, well, you know, if they had just fortified this tower over here and then strengthened that city gate over there, and if they had moved this battalion over here, no, don't rethinking, stop rethinking in your head the past. Start thinking about what's ahead of you. You're going to have to be brave going forward because yesterday you were captive and tomorrow you might be a bride. And so just see the place of your birth as your starting place. That it, this was part of the Torah's plan way back when Moses wrote this. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about this. We're sitting here having this one-way conversation. Having this conversation because Moses prophesied it. The law of the Yafat Tawar. One day, the bridegroom is going to send out and try to find as many as he can. He's going to try to find as many foreign women as he possibly can who have a spark of something beautiful inside of them. And he's going to gather them into his house. And he's going to let them grieve the things that they had to leave behind to realize who they really were. And the fact that, like the Jews say, that that law was written because of our destiny. It's mind boggling. It's mind boggling that Moses could have written those words so many thousands of years ago. And here we sit talking about that law and seeing ourselves as a Ruth or as the, the beautiful woman captured in war. And so that's just really the question. Will we take on this holy mission? Are we ready for this holy marriage? Because if so, then it's start, time to start preparing ourselves. You know, working so that when this Torah, when this word, this Devar is planted in us, that the fruit that we're exhibiting is true to the kind in his eyes, not in our eyes. Our view is going to change. His never will. So just see yourself right now is that ugly old captive woman. And now your hair is starting to grow out. You can go get you a manicure or a pedicure. Your face is not swollen anymore. You can start to put on real clothes, garments of righteousness, which are your deeds, your deeds of righteousness. You can begin to learn and to do the deeds of the Torah. And the bridegroom watches you and says, wow, I think she's going to say yes. I could tell by the clothes she's putting on. And he's been awful patient. <laughs> he's, he's been waiting around now a couple thousand years for us to make up our minds. He's given us free will. And Baruch Hashem, he's not willing that any should perish or, or should go into the garden without the opportunity to, to engage the inheritance he wants to give us. I mean, look at the inheritance that Boaz's generosity and Ruth's generosity allowed Naomi to keep in the land, in Bethlehem. And it's a key location because the spring from Hebron goes to Bethlehem, the birthplace of Yeshua. And then from Bethlehem, it goes to the, it went in the first century, it went to the Temple Mount. And that's where the high priest immersed himself before Yom Kippur. So, it makes a difference whether you engage Torah with free will and expectation or whether you're engaging it like a true captive. Like, I don't have a choice. And I hope you love it as much as I do. And I hope you see each week not as a, oh, man, how am I going to make time to study the Torah portion? But instead, 
you'll say, oh, what a gift my bridegroom has given me. He's brought me into his house. And he has given me the opportunity to soak up his word and to watch him in action. Because see, the more Torah you know, the more you see your bridegroom in action, by the way, the more you see the hand of God in this world instead of seeing the hand of the enemy. So embrace it. We're going to go forward. We're going to quit crying. We're going to quit being angry. We're going to quit replaying the battle in our heads and hitting replay in our heads. Oh, if only I'd known the Torah when I was young and it would have been so much easier to learn and now I'm too old to learn Hebrew. And Nope. Nope. You're not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Uzi says so, don't you? You agree. That's right. No more moaning and groaning, says the king of grumpy. <laughs> okay, let's see. I'm going to say goodbye here in a second. I just wanted to scroll through and, wow, there's a lot, a lot of comments. I guess I can't read them all. But I'm so glad you guys came. And we'll start working on how to start covering Song of Songs. And this, this I guess it, if, if you go through Song of Songs, you're going to be in love and you're going to quit crying about what you left behind because what's ahead of us is so much better than anything we left behind. Okay. So, yes, aloha. Good to see you there. Good to see you, Kim. I see Alaska's here. You can all, oh, Rebecca. Some of, well, I've seen new friends, too, some of you. Uh, I don't know you from class, but I'm getting to know you on here. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, we did talk to, today a little bit about the High Holy Days. And hey, Audrey. Uh, so we're, we're going to set up a live stream for you for Rosh Hashanah, which would be a a 12 o'clock service. And then we're going to set up also for you on Yom HaKippurim. And so I don't have the links to send you yet. But as soon as we get the, the thing kind of set up on YouTube so that there would be a link to even give you, maybe we can have that as early as next weekend. If so, uh, if you're not signed up on our newsletter, I will put it in there. Let's see, what is my website, thecreationgospel.com. If you're not already on our newsletter, you can go to www.thecreationgospel.com and hit the little button to sign up for the newsletter. And if there is something upcoming like that, then I'll always put it in there as my primary way of communication. I hesitate to put those two links on Facebook because just anybody could find them. And I would prefer to keep it a little more like people we consider part of our extended congregation rather than have to deal with trolls. Um, and so it's, it's for you. The link is going to be for you um, and my, my online students. So I, I promise you, I will get you that information in plenty of time and um, look forward to the high holy days so that we can put on our white garments and, uh, It'll be exciting this year. Every year is exciting, but there's there's so much craziness in the world. This year's bound to be awesome. You know, the more the harder the enemy works, the more glorious it is to be in the house of the bridegroom. So, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, good to see you again, and uh, have a wonderful week. Bye bye.